Looks like the slide says server management. So servers. We all know what a server is. It's a box that you'll never actually touch. It's locked up in a secure data center. And even if you could get into the data center, you wouldn't be able to find your server in those rows of racks. The data center, uh, you're going to have to either drive to it or uh, fly to it. And then real servers don't have graphics. So they're headless machines just sitting out there running production workloads. Huh. Let me introduce our first protagonist. William is a junior level system administrator. He's got about three years of experience, mostly working in a uh, Microsoft and a VMware background. He's primarily doing the day-to-day -day routine tasks of running the systems. So uh, William is the type of guy we like. like. He's young, he's sharp, he's enthusiastic. He's uh, out there doing everything he can to do a great job. and he's kind of new to Linux. William is running into Linux. He's discovering that it has a learning curve. Now, I know this will be a surprise to all of us, but people hitting Linux for the first time are running into a forest of acronyms, utilities, tools, LVCreate, NMCLI, Parted, or is it Part Ed? System CTL, oh, that's intuitively obvious. Yum. What kind of a program sounds delicious? MKFS.XFS, okay, yeah, that's, that's absolutely intuitively obvious. William says, help. Fred, on the other hand, is a experienced Linux systems administrator. He's been in the business for over 20 years. He's been uh, engaging in armed combat with Linux boxes for the last 15 years. Fred knows what he's doing. And Fred works with a big bag of scripts and SSH. So his way of dealing with everything on the systems is to SSH into the box. Okay, that basically turns it into a, something of a local system. And then he has this big bag of scripts that he has developed through the years, some of which he still understands. Uh, his general philosophy is, if I'm going to have to do it a second time, script the damn thing. Since he's been around for a while, he knows how you deal with new and unusual situations. You Google it. OK, powered by SSH, scripts for everything, and Google it when you don't know exactly what you're doing. Now, Fred, okay, he's one person. There are a lot of experienced Linux system administrators out there. Not enough, but uh, there's a fair number. And each one of them has their own bag of tricks. They've developed them through the years. They're all doing similar things. They're all a little bit different. And it's common to have half a dozen or a dozen different scripts doing different aspects of the same thing that are dramatically different. A lot of power, a lot of flexibility, a lot of inconsistency and uh, general cruft. Okay, this was actually the starting point for the LMI project. We went out and uh, talked to a lot of users and we got some feedback that we, the Linux community, needed to improve the manageability of the Linux systems. They said that it was just too hard for junior people to come up to speed on Linux, and that the experienced Linux systems administrators were spending too much time doing the routine day-to-day -day stuff that did not really take advantage of their skills. What they wanted was some way to allow people to more quickly come up to speed managing Linux servers, for the routine day-to-day -day tasks and free up the Linux experts for the difficult things, the unusual things, the troubleshooting, the delivering the full capabilities of the systems. Okay. So they said that it's servers, remote systems. Yep, we knew that. 
The main focus turns out to be, as a starting point, configuring storage, both local and remote storage, configuring networks, and bringing up the system so that it can use domain-based authentication, either Microsoft Active Directory authentication or um, IPA-based um, authentication. Hmm. It's starting to get a little bit interesting. It's dealing with a lot of low-level details. Reduce the learning curve for common tasks. OK. And then there's some things that uh, we were looking at. And digging into it, we noticed that it's necessary to be able to uh, help people to do their jobs better. But if you look at where things are going, particularly at scale, we really have to be able to automate everything. So anything new that we're doing in the system management space needs to be able to support both people and automation. It needs to be able to support the development, deployment, and use of rich, robust tools that can function at scale. Okay, so far so good. And we're out here in the open source community, so looking at this, one of the things that we established as a goal was that we should come up with something that was, or possible, built on uh, industry standards and was a open system, something that could be used, extended, and modified by anyone. In addition to the core parts of the system management tools that are delivered as part of the, um, the LMI project, this needed to be extended by other people, by third parties, and even by customers. So, okay, this, this looks like a uh, fairly simple set of requirements. I mean, you know, a couple of interns, knock this out in six months, what's the big deal here? So that's what we're trying to do. Let me, let me jump ahead a little bit and talk about uh, storage. Anyone here have to uh, configure storage on a server? Or is it's simple, straightforward, logical, uh, easy to do, remote systems are no problem? <laughs> None of the above. Oh, good answer, sir, good answer. All right, so where do you start with storage? The first thing that you need to do is you need to be able to uh, find out uh, what devices are on the system. Okay, so list the devices, big deal, yeah, right. Uh, SDA, SDA zero, that tells you everything you need to know. And you can use this for when you're working with the system. I mean, you can build this into scripts. It's uh, going to be consistent. It's never going to change. You can rely on, rely on it. So uh, short, easy to remember, perfect. Yeah, what happens when someone adds a drive? What happens when uh, someone moves a controller card? What happens if you go over to a different system? So you need to be able to have the ability to do uh, both the friendly device names as well as the persistent device names, which are the hideous names about this long, which, number one, you can't remember them. Number two, well, if you can remember them, you've got other issues, but we won't go into that. And if you do write them down and uh, try to type them, you're going to have a typo, so you're going to end up doing cut and paste. But the persistent device names are really useful in managing the production environment. They're easy to build into toolings, scripts, programs, tools, don't care if it's three characters long or 80 characters long, they just deal with it. So you need to be able to deal with both friendly and persistent names. You need to be able to mix and match, you need to be able to use all those in one command. You need to be able to do everything from going from a raw uh, device, either a physical disk drive or a LUN on an array, up to the point where you've got a mounted file system that applications are uh, reading from and writing to. So you need to be able to partition, format, encrypt it. You need to be able to set up uh, RAID sets. You need to be able to do logical volumes, volume groups. Um, okay. Now, dealing with this in Linux today, doing the things that are necessary to get to the point where you've got a mounted file system ready to use, you're going to be using 
half a dozen different tools and utilities, each of which is designed for a single task, each of which is, has its own syntax and command structure, each of which has its own idiosyncrasies. So this is what we were dealing with. When we were putting together LMI, we were trying to hide this. So command line interface. LMI puts you into the LMI command shell, and it allows you to point to a specific server. So to get into the LMI shell, uh, you can just do LMI and then give it the server name that uh, you're going to talk to. Or you can say LMI uh, dash H or dash host um, mm -hmm. uh, myserver.org. Uh, so once you're in the LMI script, you can work with um, all of the different capabilities. So in this case for storage, if we want to create a RAID set, it's a storage command. We're working with RAID, we're creating, we're calling it R1, and we're putting five drives into it. So in LMI, that is all that's needed to create a five drive RAID set on a remote server. Okay, maybe this is starting to look a little bit interesting. I'll go into some more detail on the different things that you can do uh, with this tool, but that's just to give you a little bit of an idea of the capabilities and also the simplicity of uh, working with it. So you've got the ability to query the, the uh, storage that's installed on the system, configure it, monitor it, change it, and update it. So what is this OpenLMI thing I've been muttering about? OpenLMI is a set of management agents that can query, configure, and monitor a server. It's a common communication infrastructure that gives you a standard way of talking to the system agents, no matter what the underlying agents do. And it's a set of client tools. The agents themselves implement a low-level API, very powerful, very flexible, not as friendly as it could be. They also um, provide a remote interface. We've implemented a scripting environment built on Python that greatly simplifies working with uh, the LMI agents. And we've also worked on implementing a high-level, very friendly and easy to use command line interface that's designed for human beings as well as for system administrators if you don't happen to believe that those two are identical. So uh, working with this, we have this set of agents. We also have a set of tooling for building these agents and this tooling is made available as part of the LMI package, so anyone can develop or modify the uh, system agents. They're called LMI providers. When you build one of these agents, uh, you then install it and register it with the object monitor, uh, standard object monitors, so you can uh, do this with any of the agents. The object monitor, monitor is the way that uh, it talks to the outside world. Primary interface to that is um, XML over HTTPS. Now, you can engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with XML if you want to, but that's not really for the faint of heart. So we've uh, greatly simplified this by providing native object interfaces to several popular languages, including Python, Java, and um, C++. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, way this works, starting from the bottom up. The OpenLMI providers are the things that do all the work. They're a set of standard management agents that um, are shipped with the operating system, are installed as part of the uh, normal operating system functions. Uh, you install OpenLMI on a server by doing yum install OpenLMI, and you've got the infrastructure and the uh, core set of agents installed. And these agents are a pretty standard object-oriented model. You've got your um, agents, which implement the classes. You have attributes and methods on those. And you've got relations, which uh, you can use to navigate the object hierarchy. So standard interfaces, so all the agents have um, a common infrastructure, a common way of communication. 
They support introspection, which means that you don't have a hard-coded external schema. You don't have to build your uh, schema into the client tools. You have the ability to ask the uh, system agents what their capabilities are. And this provides a lot of uh, flexibility. The agents themselves can be written with the standard tooling that we provide in either um, C or C++ or in Python. Uh, we've, uh, being system geeks, we're kind of biased towards um, C and C++. Uh, it's really a good language for doing long-running um, agents, particularly monitoring type applications. But Python is very friendly and flexible and allows you to very quickly develop system agents. Now, the other thing that gets interesting is um, indications, events. Has anyone had a situation where they would like to know if something happens on a system, be informed about it immediately, like a disk drive failure, or adding a user to the system, or one of your uh, NICs going offline, file systems full. So there's several ways to do this. I mean, you can write a client-side application that keeps, keeps going out, pinging your servers, and uh, asking, you, asking the servers, are the disk drives OK? Are the disk drives OK? But that's kind of a silly way to do it. You can have a monitoring console which uh, continuously updates it, so you've got a nice interactive graph. Uh, file system utilization, so you can go, OK, file system utilization is hitting 86%. I've got an 85% threshold, so I should probably look at adding some more space to that file system. Or you can have the system tell you. So this is built into the LMI uh, infrastructure. So hey, inside the providers, you've got the usual capabilities. So you've got the attributes. You can read and write the attributes. You've got the methods that you can run. You've also got the indications, which are the events. An indication is registered with the uh, SIMOM, the object monitor, which says, I have the ability to let you know any time this event happens. On the other side, on your client side, your client can say, I'm interested in this event. Please let me know whenever it occurs. The client then registers with the SIMOM saying that it's interested in these events. And whenever that event occurs, the, uh, the provider, the system agent, reports it up to SIMOM. The SIMOM looks to see who has registered to receive information on this event. And then that event is propagated back to the client side. So very powerful uh, capability for monitoring and managing systems. Then on the client side, I mentioned that we've got uh, the XML uh, interface. And you know, XML, it's verbose, but it's very flexible. You can uh, carry a lot of information in it. Yeah, XML. Python. OK, Python's basically object-oriented. It's got a set of um, objects. And Java, that Java's certainly object-oriented. OK, so we've built the interfaces where, <clears throat> using the introspection capabilities, if you're working with uh, Python, using the Python interface, the, uh, uh, the system will actually turn the LMI objects into a set of native Python objects. So you have a set of Python classes, instances. They have the um, attributes. They have the methods. So you can treat the entire open LMI management agents as a set of Python objects. So you just write Python scripts, and you have access to the full power of the system. OK, that's actually a pretty big deal. And we were looking at this and going, yep, this is just what people need. And I tried to ask the engineers some embarrassing questions. So I was asking some questions around, OK, now, how do people actually use this? 
There's a complete set of documentation available for LMI, so all of the uh, agents, all of the, uh, the objects, all the attributes, um, the methods are documented. You can look everything up, find out what the syntax, the commands are, what it does, and all of that. Have any of you developed tools to solve problems by finding something close and hacking it up? or Googling for some command fragments and finding something that looks like what you need and uh, doing a copy-paste of that. Have you ever felt guilty for this? Right. In general, don't write something from first principles unless you have a good reason for doing so. We believe that We've got a little bit of a disconnect here. We've got a low-level system API, which is really good for the system programmers. And for system admins trying to do a job, they don't think the way the system people do, and they're under a deadline. So we were looking at it and said, OK, what happens if we write as part of the project a set of standard scripts that do things in terms of the jobs the system administrator is trying to do. What happens is if instead of looking at these scripts as just a set of tools that someone will run, if we consciously consider these scripts to be part of the documentation? These are examples, these are samples, these are not intended to just sit there unmodified. What happens if we set a goal that people will grab a script, hack it up to do what uh, they need? What happens if we look at it that <clears throat> instead of opening the documentation, and the documentation is really good, they did a great job with that, but if instead of trying to uh, pop open the documentation and look up the commands, you look for something that's similar to what you're trying to do, and you can go, uh-huh, 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 what the, uh, oh, yeah. So that tools that can be used by themselves as well as examples. So I designed a set of scripts that uh, do the management tasks, and our recommendation for getting started with uh, LMI is to start with the command line interface. Yeah, I haven't really said much about the CLI. There's a CLI. I'll cover that in more detail. That if you're uh, working with the scripts, if you're trying to figure out how to do something, go into the um, LMI shell Python, look at the Python scripts, find something close, see how we did it, and either use it, copy it, or hack it up. We would respectfully suggest that you rename it if you modify it. That'll help all of us. And it's a good idea to throw it into a um, version control system, you know, throw it into Git, things like that. And if you are doing something useful, we'd like to hear about that. So uh, if you do something neat, please submit that back to the upstream project so um, other people can benefit from it. OK, so that's part of it. Java, same thing. We're system people, uh, system geeks on the LMI project, so we've been using Python as our uh, primary environment. There are more tools and examples, but if you like Java, go for it. We're also working on some advanced capabilities, including some uh, REST interfaces. And all of this goes back to the same underlying um, set of agents. So your same set of agents can be accessed through any of these languages with exactly the same capabilities. C and C++ supported, very powerful, not quite as nice in terms, uh, particularly C, in terms of dealing with the object-oriented interface. Uh, you don't have the native object capability, but for writing fast, powerful tools, a lot to be said for that. Now, if you've been looking at the LMI model, you notice what looks like a one-to-one -one mapping between a client and a managed server. And in fact, that's the way uh, it works. 
you have the capability of managing multiple servers, but you do it one server at a time. So you connect to a server, you query it, you modify it, and then you move on to the next one. One of the things that gets interesting is the question of, all right, I can manage remote servers, but how do I know uh, which remote servers I'm uh, working with? How do I know what's available um, and what systems are out there that can be managed? Does anyone have a spreadsheet of your various servers? Ah, so if no spreadsheets, you're writing it down on uh, paper or sticky notes. All right, we have discovery capabilities. And we're using the um, SLP, Service Location Protocol. You broadcast a command asking for any server which supports that capability to identify itself. Broadcast a command asking who has LMI installed and can be managed. So come back to the very server, say, me, me, me. If you're looking for a set of servers that uh, have LMI installed and are configured to use domain authentication through the system services um, security daemon, you can also ask that, and in this case, only the uh, two red servers would identify themselves. So we've got server discovery. We've got the ability to manipulate um, any of the servers. We've also got the capability to uh, build multiple applications. Since the LMI is a API for management, you can have multiple applications talking to a single server. Uh, you can even do it at the same time. You should probably try to avoid having uh, two applications updating the same underlying piece of infrastructure. Okay. So how is this implemented? We're using the DMTF uh, SIM technology stack. So we're using a set of um, off-the-shelf components. We're using a standard Open Pegasus um, SIMOM. We're using a standard uh, tooling for building the applications. We're using the object file definition language, and uh, we're using a uh, common interface called CMPI, which allows you to build a set of interoperable agents. We're using the DMTF models as a reference point. We believe that there is a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge built into these models, but that the mod models themselves, I'll be diplomatic, are not optimal for implementation. So we've taken the uh, DMTF models as a starting point, used the pieces of them that we can, and extended them where necessary to deliver Unix capabilities. So yes, it's built on uh, SIM, but it's actually usable. We've built a set of standard providers that are included in the system to uh, address storage, network, services, users, software, and a set of other things. These are the starting point. The significance of these agents is that they are standard system agents being shipped as part of the operating system. So they uh, come with the operating system. Today they're included in uh, Fedora and uh, RHEL, RHEL 7. We um, have been working with SUSE. SUSE is uh, shipping a subset of these, and LMI is an open upstream project. We would like to have um, all Linux distributions using it and hopefully contributing to it. So if this looks like some uh, useful capabilities that are not on the operating system that you're uh, currently using, ask uh, that project to uh, get involved with it. We'd be uh, delighted to work with them. Since they are part of the operating system, it means that it's available and it can be installed and used on um, any of the servers that it is updated and maintained as part of the operating system. So traditionally, the biggest problem with uh, management agents is getting them on the boxes and keeping them current. If the agents are shipped as part of the operating system, both of those issues are resolved and you've got uh, better guarantees for compatibility. Okay. 
I've been muttering about a lot of things up here, and hopefully it sounds interesting. And is anyone wondering if the stuff I'm talking about is actually real and works? Thank you, you have experience and honesty. So let's run through some examples of it. Building a rate set. I gave an example a few minutes ago where you've got one line, simple, easy to understand, builds a rate set, that's all you need and you're off and running. Yeah. All right. A rate set to be useful, you build the rate set, that gives you a storage pool to work with. If you're in a server environment, you're going to be using volume management, so you need to create a volume group or add the, um, the new resource to an existing volume group. You need to put that volume group into a logical volume. You need to create a file system on that logical volume, and then you need to mount it. So with Linux, this is simple, straightforward. I mean, anyone can do this, right? You've got different commands for creating the rate set, for creating the uh, volume groups, and um, you've got to partition it, and then you've got to mount it. Using LMI, you have a set of high-level commands, and it breaks down to greater detail. Anything involving storage is going to be part of the storage command. So LMI, point at the server, you're authenticated, you're in the server. Storage, uh, you're going to be working with storage. There are a set of uh, capabilities. You can do um, a set of operations with RAID, with volume group, logical volumes, file systems. This is so simple that even I can do it. And uh, the primary tool for learning how to um, use LMI at the CLI level is the help command and a little bit of practice. So. This is, this is really beginning to highlight what we're trying to do to simplify management of Linux systems. Now, there are a couple of ways that we could have done this. One would have been to say, okay, there's a set of storage capabilities we need. Let's write everything as part of the um, LMI providers, and we can get exactly what we need and some really good capabilities, and it'll be a fun science project. Okay, we didn't do that. Instead, we're uh, building LMI on top of the underlying native tools. So we're still using Parted, we're still using um, FDisk, and we're using LVCreate under the hood. But what we're doing is making those accessible and easy to use for people who don't remember all of the um, arcane commands and for tools and scripts. So let's see what this looks like in some other things. Uh, networks. Quick questions. How many NICs does a server have? <laughs> as many as you can put in it. We have some experienced people in the audience here. A server is not going to have a single NIC. A server is probably going to have four or five, up to a dozen or more NICs in it. They're going to be divided between the management plane, storage plane, data plane, and perhaps something for external communication. So you've got to find out uh, what's in the system. You need to uh, find out uh, what they're doing, how they're configured, and you need to work with them. Okay. As you can probably guess, all of the networking functions are behind net. So start off with net. We want to find out what uh, NICs are in the system. Those would be devices. We want to list them. This gives us the uh, list of the NICs. There's a variety of things that you can do here. I'll just take one example. You want to assign an IP address to a NIC. Fairly common operation. Okay, it's a network. It's an address. And you're going to replace the current address on the EM1 NIC with uh, the 192.168.0.130. Okay, is anyone going to ask why we're doing replace and not assign? 
because there is also a <coughs> net address assigned. And not being as bright as my engineers, I asked them that question. And they said, well, you do realize, of course, that you can assign multiple IP addresses to a single NIC. And if uh, you're doing this, you may want to make sure that this new IP address is the only one assigned to that NIC. Yeah, right. OK, I knew that. Uh, and then activate it. Installing an application. Well, let's, we need HTTPD. We need Apache installed on it. So let's check. So SW, software, you, you can probably guess where this one's going. We want to show details on a particular uh, software package, the HTTPD package. So mm, that command gives us the information on um, which package is available. And it turns out that uh, the available package in the repository is the Apache 2.4.9, and it's not currently installed. OK, software install. HTTPD, and you've got the package installed. You can also update the package, and you can uh, remove the packages. So your basic package uh, management capabilities. Services. Services are good things. So good set of capabilities for working with services. We uh, can find out, uh, we can get a list of all the services. We can find out in the state, so in this case, we wanted to uh, check on the cup service. Service, OK, that's pretty obvious. Show cups. And uh, it's installed, enabled, and running. We can stop it. We can restart it. And we can do the other uh, normal operations with it. Rebooting a server. OK, power. Yep, that's pretty obvious. The available states. And then we can um, reboot or power off the server. LMI is running inside the operating system, so we don't have the capability to power on a server from inside the operating system. Need to do that through um, other interfaces. We're looking at how to include um, the ability to access BMCs or managed power switches from the uh, LMI shell client environment. OK. Hopefully, everything is sounding good so far. But there may be a couple of questions in your mind. What about Puppet? So who is using Puppet or Chef or Ansible or Salt or another configuration management tool? And without a show of hands, uh, who is asking themselves right now why they're listening to me? Thank you very much. <laughs> Puppet and LMI do different things. Puppet and uh, Chef and the rest of them are very good at putting a system into a known state. So where you know what the system should look like and you want to put it into a state and ensure that it remains in that state, absolutely use Puppet or Chef or one of the other tools. These are very good for standardized systems and for uh, scale out. So if you've got a standardized infrastructure, you know, two sockets with uh, minimal local storage and a couple of NICs, uh, common in the scale out environments. If you have uh, virtual machines that um, are known machines and you're building with images, the configuration tools are pretty much the method of choice. If you're dealing with more complex situations, if you need to query a machine, if you need to find out what the machine uh, is, what it's doing, if you need to interact with the machine, that's where LMI comes into its element. We view the two as being very complementary, that uh, they do different things, both of which are needed and useful, and that there's a place for both. And we also believe that uh, the configuration management tools, particularly if you're using um, additional scripts and modules that are not shipped as part of the core package, you end up with working with storage, a dozen different puppet modules that do 80% the, uh, the same thing, a little bit uh, different, and the way they work internally are quite different. 
So uh, we'd like to um, provide the standardized low-level interface, which can be used inside tools like uh, Puppet and Chef. Long-term goal, it's where we'd like to go with some of this. Security. Now, security is not a major concern for people administering servers. I, I understand this, but still, it, the, the question comes up sometimes. Security is one of the big things we're doing. First of all, all communications uh, in LMI are encrypted. Everything is um, authenticated. The current implementation of um, LMI is using standard uh, username password authentication and a uh, standard service account. So this is a good start. We've got um, certificates on the system, so you've got the um, certificate and the uh, login capability and the encrypted. It's entirely usable. Uh, there's good basic security there. It also works with SE Linux in enforcing mode and putting my hat on as a security person, please turn SE Linux on and leave it running. Thank you, this was a paid announcement. Um, so all of um, LMI does work with SE Linux in enforcing mode. We're working on some enhancements for this. One of these is um, adding GSS API authorization uh, to the um, to LMI, uh, we're working upstream with the Open Pegasus community to add this capability. And this will mean that instead of everyone using a LMI user account on the local machine, that you'll be able to log in with your actual uh, personal account, your system administrator account, and access the machine. This has several things that are quite nice. One is that it means that the logs, the audit logs, and the rest of the logs now tell you who was actually doing the different operations and commands. So it provides much better traceability and auditability. But it also works in conjunction with some uh, extensions that we're doing to add role-based access control to um, LMI. We're working with the uh, RollKit package such that uh, in conjunction with the um, GSS API support, you will be able to control and restrict access that different people have. The current implementation of LMI, like most of the management tools, is binary. You're either root or you can't do anything. Uh, but there's a lot on the system that really requires root access but there are a lot of uh, places where you don't want to necessarily give everyone full root access to your servers. So future release of uh, LMI will have the um, ability to control what capabilities each individual user has. It's also extensible. We're shipping a basic set of uh, role-based policies with LMI, but since it's based on RollKit, you would have the ability to extend or modify this role-based access. Okay, some information currently available in, with full capabilities in Rel 7 and Fedora 20. The upstream project, the uh, place all the work is occurring, is at lmi.org. Um, I've been doing quite a bit of um, writing about LMI on my blog at uh, techponder.wordpress.com. There's a mailing list. There is a um, IRC channel. And we're just about on the time mark. So at this point, uh, let's open it up for questions. I think we've got uh, the break now, so I'm willing to stick around as long as anyone has questions. Yep, we have time for about one question. Got it. Uh, so you stated at the beginning of the, uh, your talk that one of your goals is to simplify some of the complex uh, in operations for entry-level staff. Yes. And I'm, is there any concern that we're like codifying a segregation of skills? Because if the entry-level people only use the abstracted interface and what they learn 
is to use LMI, are we then creating LMI admins and not Unix or Linux admins? Whoa. That is a very interesting question. And congratulations, that's the uh, first time that one's come up. You know, that could happen. Um, I th that, that could very well happen. If you've got someone who is just looking at getting a task done, they find one way of doing that task and then they do that forever, uh, that could happen. Uh, my experience with most system administrators is that uh, they want to, they're curious. They want to learn more. And we've designed this so that you can come in through the CLI, that takes you so far. When you need to go beyond that, uh, you start getting down into the scripts, the Python scripts, and that's where you read the RTFS, read the fine scripts, uh, and start modifying those. And then if that doesn't take you far enough, go down and start writing your own code against the uh, low-level API. So we've tried to make it accessible, provide the ability to work down to uh, the very lowest level of detail in a uh, sane fashion. But, but I, I think you're right. If someone wants to just do something, move on, and not learn anymore, this would enable that. Interesting. Let's give a round of applause for our speaker. Thank you.